I am Marie Chapman Hansen, married woman with two children who had a love affair with the sheriff, Rodney Salisbury, a married man, six children. The village of Plentywood was mystified that a respectable woman such as myself would flaunt convention for love. He was fascinating. He read widely and was interested in world events. He spoke of the Russian Revolution and how the minority party, the Bolsheviks, rebelled against the oppressive czar. He had read Karl Marx, and I learned about the exploitation of one class by another. His hero was Leon Trotsky. He told me how marriage was a bourgeois convention, oppressive for women, making them chattel. He believed in free love, and it made sense. For who can stop lovers from feeling the way they do? I was eager to learn. Knowledge is so erotic and aphrodisiac. <laughs> he was passionate about justice and lived pursuing it. He championed the underdog, and he had a generous view of the world. He liked people in all their varieties, and they liked him. Politicians, bootleggers, farmers, prostitutes, teachers, hobos, lawyers, wobblies. When IWW workers who belonged to a union of anarchists were passing through town, they knew they had a bed at the jail and a hot meal. Their motto, workers of the world unite, was his motto. He was one of them, a wobbly. He was a kind man. He rode his horse out to see lonely sheep herders and struggling homesteaders. They never forgot that he visited them, brought coffee, tobacco, would have a drink of whiskey with them and leave the bottle behind. He was voted sheriff twice. Prohibition, he thought, was a bad law leading to corruption. You can't legislate morals on your terms, he said. He, like so many others, crossed the Canadian border and trafficked moonshine. And believe me, some of it would melt your socks. <laughs> Harvard-educated Charlie Taylor, with his radical progressive ideas, was sent to Plentywood by the Nonpartisan League to start a newspaper. The League was a, a movement of farmers who wanted state control of farm-related industries. He and Rodney shared values and became close friends. Many of their organizing goals were achieved here in the Farmer Labor Temple. It was the social center for meetings, parties, and dances. Rodney and I had good times here. We did not hide our relationship and we ignored the gossip. Our son Howard Froberg was born. When the courthouse was robbed, Rodney investigated. He never found the people responsible. Unfortunately, a rumor circulated that he was an inside job with the sheriff masterminding it and giving the money to the Communist Party. Rodney had suspicions of who did it, but no proof. Meanwhile, there was always nature to contend with. The force of those dust storms in the dirty 30s was unbelievable, destroying the crops of the farmers. I can still feel the grit in my teeth. Rodney, a farmer himself, understood and wanted to help. The farmers had a boom and bus cycle. Good times, they borrowed heavily from the bank to buy machinery to increase their harvest. When years of no rain and drought came, the drops failed. They couldn't meet their mortgages. Eventually, the banks foreclosed. And when the banks foreclosed, Rodney delivered the notice to the farmer and presided at the sheriff's auction that followed. The farmers were organized so well, they gathered in support of each other. Nobody would bid high. And once a farm was sold for a dollar, and the owner simply bought it back. Meanwhile, in our private life, Janice, Rodney's 15-year-old daughter, died of a burst appendix. We all grieved. He had a Bolshevik funeral for her, and the young pioneers, carrying red flags, marched down Main Street singing, the worker's flag is deepest red. Oh, it was a beautiful tribute to her. And the depression deepened around us. Agriculture collapsed. There were no jobs. People starved. Rodney felt something had to be done. He ran for governor on the communist ticket. 
He lost the election, didn't even win Sheridan County, and Roosevelt became president and responded to the crisis with innovative policies to create jobs and help farmers. Rodney saw many of his ideas put into practice. It was the end of an era and the beginning of the New Deal. Our second child, a daughter, was born. The Bolshevik funeral, the scandal of our relationship, the rumor that he robbed the courthouse finished him politically. I got a divorce. My two children with Andrew stayed with him as part of the settlement, a great loss. We moved on to Billings, where our third child was born. It was a spring morning in June, and Rodney was going to Plentywood to ask his wife once again for a divorce so we could marry. Come with me, he implored, but I wanted to stay home and make strawberry jam, do wifely chores. Little did I know that I would never have the happiness of seeing him again. It was all so sudden, a phone call that he was dying, the hectic journey across the miles to Plentywood, arriving at the hospital too late. He was at the morgue, dead of a cerebral hemorrhage, and I was not allowed to see him, his family's request. So it's just me now, no money, our three children to raise and educate. People ask me, do you have regrets? Some, yes, the loss of my two oldest children. Rodney, no regrets. Our love was the right thing, just the wrong time. 